Yes, welcome everyone to this Palm Sunday, the beginning of the Holy Week. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 22. The first reading will be uh, chapters 1 through 5. You may find this on page 490 in your red Bible or in 615 in the blue large print Bible. So beginning Psalm 22 verse 1 through 5. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and, you were, and we were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Then again, beginning at verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offering offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. Then again, beginning at verse 28. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and, and any who proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. The word of God. Today's gospel reading is from Matthew, verses 38 to 50 and 54. Then the two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and look and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. We live not by bread alone, but by the very word that comes from God. As you know, in the liturgical calendar, today is Palm Sunday. 
Today, we celebrate Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. This is a joyous day, but our joy is temporary because the coming week is Holy Week, which culminates with Good Friday as we remember Jesus' execution by crucifixion. There's a lot of liturgical gloom and personal reflection to ponder between now and Friday. So be ready to contemplate, meditate, and mourn over the coming days. Next week, of course, is Easter. And that's a happy time. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Because we are now inside a very liturgical moment within the church calendar, we should focus on liturgy. And it's hard to focus on liturgy without the Psalms. You've already recited portions of Psalm 118 this morning, and a lot of it, I'm sure, sounded very familiar. You heard it within our first gospel lesson, following our palm procession this morning. And you recited more than you're probably used to, and it probably sounded a little odd, if not wrong. You only expected to hear what you know from Matthew or Mark. Jesus arrives into town, riding on a donkey, and people throw palm fronds in the front of his path. Then they proclaim, according to Matthew and Mark, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. In Christian tradition, we refer to this moment as the triumphal entry. And this title has colored how Christians think about Palm Sunday's events. Because we call it triumphal entry, and because you've been told the donkey is a royal animal in Israel, you are invited to picture thousands upon thousands of Israelites celebrating the arrival of the Messiah, that is, Jesus. They call him out as their Messiah, their future king, the son of David, the one they've waited on for so long to free them from Roman occupation. He's here now in Jerusalem, arriving victoriously to save him. So the Jews break out joyously, in deed and in song, proclaiming, Hosanna, 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 which means, save us, save us, save us. What a moment, if you can imagine it. And once you've listened to Matthew, you can't help but imagining it happening this way. Now, it's even more intense in Luke and John, where the crowd doesn't just hail Jesus as a son of David, they explicitly call him king. This glorious welcome on Palm Sunday, celebrating Jesus as their coming king, makes the rest of Holy Week all the more puzzling all the more surprising, all the more inexplicable. How could the Israelites transition from enthusiastic and overwhelming support on Sunday to cries for execution by Friday? How can tens of thousands of people be that fickle all in unison? Well, what if they weren't being fickle? What if they had no idea who Jesus was? What if all those declarations of praise and Hosanna weren't meant for Jesus? Or maybe they weren't meant exclusively for Jesus? I said this is a week to consider liturgy. The famous line, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord is liturgy. And it was liturgy long before our Gospels were written or Jesus walked in, or rode into Jerusalem. This line comes from Psalm 118. And Psalm 118 plays a liturgical role in Israelite pilgrim festivals. All the Psalms from 113 to 118 play a liturgical role. According to the law in Deuteronomy, all Israelites were expected to travel to Jerusalem three times a year to worship there. At Passover and again at Pentecost in the spring 
and at tabernacles in the fall. In Jesus' day, when pilgrims would arrive in Jerusalem to worship, the locals would sing these psalms in order to welcome them, to make that feel at home in their larger religious family, to remind them that what the arduous journey that they had taken to the holy city in the first place was all about. This becomes clear when we consider the whole of Psalm 118, and not just the one part of a verse that Matthew provides. And that's why we recited it earlier this morning. When you back up and consider more of Psalm 118, it becomes apparent that this is a pilgrimage song. It begins, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And that's followed by a refrain, His steadfast love endures forever. Continuing on, Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. This is a community song. It's a call and response Israelite hymn. Moving on to the portion we read earlier, again, you can feel the liturgy, the communal nature, and the Jerusalem element of Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may, may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. These are the lines that Jesus and his disciples would have sung and heard as they enter Jerusalem. But the thing is, these are the lines that every pilgrim would have heard as they enter Jerusalem. The locals wanted everyone to feel welcome, so they sang this song and others like it to the visitors as they approached the temple. And of course, they would continue to sing to the end, including the famous line that Matthew gives us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Notice that the song even includes lines about laying down branches in front of the parade on the way to the temple. It's a temple and pilgrim song, not strictly a Messiah song. The song ends with the familiar refrain that we learned at the beginning. His steadfast love endures forever. That's the line every local wants every pilgrim to remember. It's all right there. And Jesus is living the psalm as an experience. Entering town and being reminded by everything around him how great God is. But the thing is, every other pilgrim experienced this too. The crowd wasn't proclaiming Jesus as their king as he entered. He was just another pilgrim among the teeming crowds. The people singing probably had no idea who he was, this outsider from Galilee. They didn't know he was someone special. They didn't know he was the arriving Messiah. The crowds were just singing like they always do when tourists come to town. Everyone entering Jerusalem that morning received this same blessing. Every arrival had come in the name of the Lord. Every visitor deserves to get this welcoming treatment. Now, I'm not here to deny that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John reinterpret this particular pilgrim procession as a public proclamation of Jesus, or of his messiahship, or of his kingship. It's very clear 
that each of our gospel writers want us, the audience, to make this conclusion. And I'm not here to deny that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was anything less than triumphant. Anything less than messianic. The Messiah moment is precisely why we're here today. But I am here to tell you that the singing crowds were caught up in their own liturgical moment. They were not intentionally playing a part of Jesus' salvation drama that he was there for. Yes, they publicly proclaim him blessed. Yes, they sing Hosanna, which means save us in Aramaic. And yes, they had no idea who he was. Sure, some knew his name and some recognized he was a prophet. But they didn't expect a prophet to be a Messiah, to be a Savior, or to be a King. These people were simply singing their liturgy like they always did, and they had no idea how true their song was this particular morning for this particular pilgrim. It's because they didn't understand what Sunday represented that they could so easily turn on him later this same week. So, if you've ever wondered how the crowds could be so excited about Jesus on Sunday and so ready to kill him by Friday, hopefully now you understand. They didn't quickly change their minds about him. Rather, over the coming days, the people would get to know a stranger who disturbed them with dangerous talk about destroying the temple. And let's be honest, Jesus didn't disturb them with talk about the temple. He caused a scene at the temple at a very pilgrim-crowded time. Matthew tells us how passers-by would taunt Jesus on the cross about the temple. They weren't the only ones mocking him. The thieves alongside him on the cross mocked him too. And so did the priests, and so did the scribes, and so did the elders. The way that Matthew tells the story, it seems like everyone was mocking Jesus, which in a real sense is an intentional part of the crucifixion experience. Despite all the mocking going on all around him, however, Jesus doesn't appear to listen. Or, that's what you've been taught to imagine. That's what the passers-by think, too. They're telling him to save himself. They're telling him to come down from the cross. They're laughing that he still trusts in God while he's on the cross. So how does Jesus respond? Or does he respond? When Jesus does finally speak, he cries, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. According to Matthew, when Jesus says in English, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The people think he's calling for Elijah. That is, they think Jesus is begging for supernatural help in the time of desperate need. Admittedly, while watching Jesus die there on the cross, the idea that he's begging for help or feeling abandoned, this idea makes sense. It's the natural conclusion, but the thing is, it's not the correct conclusion. Sure, interpreting Jesus' final words as a pained cry fits the immediate context, but it completely misses the point. Jesus was not crying in pain. Jesus never felt abandoned, even in this worst moment. And Jesus didn't ignore the people around him mocking him. His final words served as his answer to those people. 
They joked that he still expected God to save him. They yelled, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to. And they thought his words, why have you forsaken me, to be a painful cry to God. They didn't realize Jesus was talking to them. They didn't realize Jesus was answering their taunts directly. They didn't realize Jesus was quoting liturgy as he answered them. As I said, we are entering Holy Week, and Holy Week has many liturgical moments. And as I said, it's hard to focus on liturgy without the Psalms. Here, Jesus could not ignore the liturgical use of the Psalms, even at his death. We must realize, and what the mockers missed, was that Jesus quotes Psalm 22, which was our second reading today. Despite their taunts, Jesus still trusted in God, and he told us so. He might have even sung it to them if they had been listening. Yes, whatever energy, with whatever energy he could muster, he probably sang out the preferred melody of the psalm as he sang, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it was a melody called the deer of the dawn. They simply didn't listen close enough to hear the familiar tune according to the deer of the dawn as he sang in his last breaths. You see, Jesus identified the psalm by its title or by the psalm's first line. Like many of our hymns and prayers today, in Jewish tradition, psalms and prayers are known by their opening lines. So when Jesus cried out from the cross, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, he directly answered everyone, effectively shouting, yes. I will proclaim his deliverance, saying that he has done it, which are the closing lines of that psalm. Consider the psalm for a moment as I explain. Of course, the song opens with our lament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From words of my groaning, O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. If this were the end of the psalm, Good Friday would indeed be a very depressing day. If all we knew was that one line in Matthew it would seem like Jesus had lost faith on the cross. But we continue because this is the point Jesus is making. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. You see, Jesus didn't lose faith. He remembered that his ancestors trusted in God. Jesus remembered that his ancestors cried out to God. He remembered that his ancestors were vindicated by God. This is the perfect response to Jesus' mockers. They laugh because they see Jesus still trusts in God and he still expects deliverance. Jesus notes that Israel trusted and God saved them. But there's more yet to this psalm. Jesus doesn't merely focus on a historical memory. He calls himself as a witness to that memory. As you heard earlier, the psalm continues. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters, for God did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. By implicitly invoking these lines, Jesus reiterates that he knows 
God will save him from the cross. And he anticipates that the entire world will know this too. After all, the psalm ends with this declaration. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Jesus then dies, forever trusting in the God who saves him. And here we are as future generations still being told about it. Again, what better reply could Jesus have given that afternoon to everyone who mocked him? The key to this interpretation, the key to this inspiration, rests in knowing liturgy. Just like the key to understanding Palm Sunday and the Israelites in Jerusalem that day rests in liturgy, rests in the Psalms, understanding Jesus' final words on Good Friday rests in liturgy, rests in the Psalms. The people there that first Good Friday didn't remember their liturgy. So they didn't understand the faith that Jesus still has in God. But now you know. You remember. So now you understand. Jesus still has faith because the liturgy taught him to believe. God is holy and God delivers those who trust in him. In Jesus' case, on that first Good Friday, God did deliver Jesus because Jesus still trusts in him. And now we can proclaim this deliverance. So please, proclaim this deliverance once more with me. Let us proclaim. Future generations will be told about the Lord. Let us proclaim. Proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Let us proclaim. He has done it. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. and thirst in this dry and weary land. Be reconciled to God. Amen. Amen.